All right, it's Monday. That means it's time to catch up with our All-American linebacker analyst, Jay Lehman. Jay, uh, one step forward for the defense, but but a step back for the offense in a 30-13 to loss to number seven Penn State that, that felt really closer than it was, but it also just never felt like your offense gave you a chance to actually win the game. Yeah, it's – I, I actually am in more encouraged this week than I was last week um, just because our front played up to their ability. They can, especially on the defensive side at moments, at moments on the offensive side, uh, we'll talk about that as they mix some things up. I thought they were overall better. Um, I think a Brett Bielema team has got to be physical. I don't think we got out physical. And so that's where I take some solace, right? Like I'm like, okay, we're not getting beat up. Um, Because we've seen years, guys, of Illinois football just getting destroyed in the trenches. That's not the case, right? And and we'll talk about it. Johnny Newton, by far the best football player on the field, regardless of position, right, and what he was able to do and whatnot. But overall, it felt like you're just plugging holes in a dam, right? It's like, okay, bam, we got that filled up now in the defensive line. They're playing, oh, man, we're having turnovers all over the place. But it's it's been really disappointing because I felt like the defense played well enough for us to win at least at least through three quarters. They got a little bit worn out there near the end. Um, but off, you just can't give the ball up five times um, and have four picks. What went so wrong for Luke Altmeyer? Yeah, that, that's really a good question. Um, number one, I think it's really as being the guy. I know he played some in a bowl game at um, Ole Miss, but as being the guy at Illinois is really his first. Big, big top uh, ranked opponent game, right? At home. I think he tried to do too much, number one. Um, number two, um, he didn't get sacked as much as you know you might have thought, but he took a lot of hits. One thing I'll give Luke Altmeyer a lot of credit for, and we saw this on the fourth down play in Toledo, is he has the ability to realize I'm getting sacked. I need to get the ball and throw it away. He doesn't hold on to the ball too long. I think that's uh, actually a good uh, quality that he possesses. Unfortunately, when you're when you're throwing the ball away in over the middle uh, under pressure or into tight coverage with some great athletes he was thrown against, it can lead to some interceptions. Right? Some of those he should just throw into the upper deck if he could have, and he didn't do that. Right? At the same time, um, you know, I, I think also he got down and um, he really let the first mistake compound the second, third, and fourth. And so I think that's a mental toughness thing. He's going to learn. Remember, he doesn't have nearly as much. We knew there's going to be some growing pains. Uh, the knock, I think he's a more, from a skill set perspective, has a little more talent than Tommy DeVito, but from an experience, does not have the same experience. And so I think what we saw is we saw a quarterback really go into the tank um, mentally because yeah. he still has the ability there, but I mean, just was making throws that were uncharacteristic. And I think ultimately that's why they had to say, Hey, we can't put him back out there and we've got to make a switch. I think he'll learn from that. I don't think it's a physical thing. It was more of a mental thing and you're getting hit and hit and hit and hit. And they really bottle him up on the run game as well. And so he didn't have that to fall back on. So it was difficult. Yeah, Jay, I think what was so impressive of the first two games with him was his ability to bounce back from those mistakes. I think we all knew these mistakes would happen with a first-time starting quarterback with so few um, sure. reps uh, of experience. So what is the key for him and the staff after a game like this, the, the 48 hours after it, the, the week after it leading into Florida Atlantic, to get him back confident? Because we know he's a, he's a playmaker. He's pretty yeah. good. You can't let four interceptions one game – carry over to the next game. Yeah, I mean, you can't lose the next game because you're worried, you're, you're sad about the previous game. I always like to say, you know, when I'm talking to youth football teams, you know, you like to have these catchy lines. You know, you can't live in the guilt or the glory of the last play. You have to play the next play, you know. Sometimes you get overly excited about a great play and then you don't do good the next play. Or you get overly guilty about the last play and you don't do great the next play. And so I think this is where the coaches really make their money, honestly. Uh, because they got to keep Luke Altmaier, our guy, from, from going in the tank. And, and to your point, actually responded really well in those first two games to some mistakes that he made. So he has the capacity to do that. Let's remember, Luke Altmaier is, what, uh, 20 years old? He's still a young guy, right? I mean, he's still got lots of reps to play. He's going to be a good player. He also, we, we don't have a guy right now that we can go to for a catch. Who's the guy that I can go like, I need a catch? We thought that might be Pat Bryant. Hasn't been the last two weeks. 
We thought that might be Isaiah Williams. I would say he's that guy on short routes, but maybe not on longer routes. Casey Washington, he's a guy that can do contested catches, but quite frankly, can't get the separation. And there was some, I mean, I, I, it looked like there was four or five targets to Casey Washington and two or three picks on those targets, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't necessarily have a guy. I, I think that could be possibly Tip Ryman. He seems to be a good security blanket guy. I know that it's not basically maybe your usual suspect you were thinking, but they seem to have a good rhythm on giving him the ball on short passes, something to kind of get his confidence back going. And also um, Barry Lunny, being a former quarterback himself, has got to really get into his head and realize, hey, it's going to be okay. Let's move forward. Jay, let's talk about that offensive line. Penn State's defense is really good. Their front sure. set, those linebackers, man. Abdul Carter is, is a really good yeah. player. Uh, but Illinois reworks the offensive line. Only gave up one sack in the first three quarters, but I mean, he was constantly under pressure uh, against that great Penn State defensive front. What did you see out of that group? Because it still seems like they're not getting the offensive line play they expected yet this year. Yeah, so I would say this. I think Zy Chrysler is a better guard than he is tackle. Definitely feels more comfortable. Unfortunately, I think Isaiah Adams is a better guard than he is tackle. Um, and that's not to say that Isaiah Adams didn't play decent. I just think when you think a road grader and, you know, offensive guard, Isaiah Adams is pro is the prototype for that, really. He really is. Although he's athletic enough and smart enough to do that and does that for the team. I think we're still, we're still having some issues. Um, uh, Julian Pearl, for the most part, has quietly been oh, solid and okay. Like, I thought he's been solid. I think we knew that Geske and even Kruitz would have some growing pains. I mean, the center play has really been outstanding in the last couple of years for Illinois and Pilstrom and, and also with uh, Doug Kramer. And uh, Kruitz is a young football player. I think he's going to be a great football player. He's got some growing He's got some growing pains as well. And so um, we're, not, we're, we're not great on the protection. Um, uh, we but we're also going on with a very good front. Chop Robinson's probably a first round pick. Um, Abdul Carter blitzing, covering. He's probably going to be a first round pick at some point. King's probably a first round pick. They have first round picks at every level. And so this is a talented defense. I didn't think the offensive line played horrible, but certainly didn't give us the time that we needed. Yeah. Jay, you mentioned, I was thinking about after this game, you know, Reggie Love is consistent, solid, reliable. He just screams tough, smart, and dependable. And you really? see on that that, that run, uh, that touchdown run, like that's kind of what Brett Bielema wants to be. So if you had sure. 11 Reggie Loves on the field, I think you'd feel pretty good. But really him and Isaiah Williams seem like the only consistent skill players at this position, um, given that, you know, Casey's consistent, tough, smart, dependable, but just not uh, a guy who gets separation. We saw some young guys get in there. Caden Fagan, Malik Elzey, Kanari Wilcher. Ashton Hollins, we've seen a little bit more of Hank Beatty the last couple of weeks. Is it time to get more reps for those guys? Or what is that like? Like how, how does a coaching staff work in freshmen who might not be as good at the details as say a, a Pat Bryant and blocking or Casey Washington at blocking and route running and all that? Well, if you're Ron Zook, or really it's Ben starts from day one, I think. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, so I think it's a different style. I think it's a developmental program. Zook, well, I don't, not to say Zook didn't develop people. I'm not saying that at all, but I think he gave a chance for guys to play early if the measurables were there. Um, I think it's time that we see some of these guys. I really do. I think Malik Elzey earned himself some more playing time by getting that contested catch. He's just a different type of athlete than we're accustomed to seeing in the receiver room. I mean, the, the size, the physicality, the speed, um, I don't think you can keep him off the field. I think Caden Fagan is another guy who is going to start getting some reps from Josh McCray. They're, they're similar builds, but I think that uh, Fagan seems to have a little bit better acceleration out of the hole from what I could see. Um, and maybe a little bit more versatility to run, you know, a, a, a big fullback or H back position in different sets where he could protect along with Ryman. Now that's asking him to do a lot as a true freshman. I know he was here during the spring, but I think that this is like, we're still building this program. I think you need to get him. Wiltshire and Beatty, those are guys. Can they get more separation than the other guys is the question. If they can't, you're certainly not going to put them in because their body types don't necessarily warrant them to get in if they can't get separation. Right. So I think you only put Wiltshire and, 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 and Beatty in. I thought Ashton Hollins and, and, uh, you know, I heard you mention this on your post game pod with uh, uh, with Wagner, and that route 
that combination was a good call by Lonnie to kind of get Ashton Hollins in space. Wasn't a great thrown ball, kind of yeah. underthrown, but Hollins kind of has the speed and length too that makes you feel like he's a little bit different, kind of like Elzy. Um, and I know Pat Bryant has the body. I mean, they say he, he doesn't look nearly as tall as Hollins, Pat Bryant, or as big as Elzy. Um, and I think Bryant can be good. He just has not gotten – the he hasn't gotten open the way we thought he'd get open the last two games, but I think he's still probably the most complete receiver on this team. But to your question, do I think we need to get those guys on? On yes, I think we need to have the best eleven playing, and you got to mix up your personnel to how do I get the best eleven on the field, right? Yeah. Um, I think certainly think Reggie and Isaiah are part of that, but I think there's some discrepancy based on personnel on who those other three skill guys could be in in the football game. Jay, we talked last week. Okay, you got two two weeks of sample size for the defense. They had to change some things. We'll get into those here in a second. But if you're Barry Lonnie this week and, and you struggled, your quarterback struggled like that, and you just haven't been able to get in a rhythm offensively, like mm -hmm. what do you think this offense needs right now? Well, it's interesting because in, in Brett's post-game press conference, he said they really focused on that opening drive, right? And there's little things, and – if you go back and look at that little thing, those little things, they really made a difference on that opening drive. You know, Altmaier has one of his better runs and slips for a seven yard gain. He probably could have had a 15 yard gain, uh, which puts us even closer into field goal range. We didn't get a penalty, I believe, on one of the linemen for a false start. I think it was Gasky got a false start, backed us up, right? We then missed the field goal and don't get points, which I think was a little deflating for that team that had focused so, so much. And that would have been, that would have been big. Um, I don't think we've actually seen a whole offensive game plan actually play out. You know, I, I'm imagining the offensive coaches and Barry Lunny having this whole plan. And if a good offensive coordinator always sets up a defense in the first quarter to come back and hit him with something that looks like what they hit him with in the first quarter, but this is a little bit different, right? And they're setting up plays throughout the game. We haven't had a chance to actually do that. I think that because we've gotten behind or because of turnovers, it's kind of been in scramble mode offensively. I don't think we've seen the talent that Barry Lunny can call plays with because of all those issues. And so I don't think we've actually seen a, a game that's called the way that Barry Lunny wants to call it or that it's actually been game planned just because of how it's all worked out. And part of that issue is that there is nothing right now that this offense can hang its hat on. At least we had Chase Brown, no matter what, right? Yep. Stuff hits the fan. Let's get back. Let's get right. Let's give it the ball to Chase, right? And – one thing I saw, too, defensively from Penn State, Manny Diaz runs a defense that I would call is a, is a spill defense, meaning that he's going to make everything spill east and west to the outside and make those running backs get to the outside. You'll see a couple of plays in the first half. We actually get the edge, right? I mean, there's a lot of bodies. If you just take a screenshot of that, uh, of, of, of that tape, you'll see a lot of bodies condensed and Manny Diaz's defense trying to get upfield and make the ball bounce outside. If we had a guy like Chase Brown, we would have had a couple touchdowns actually in the first quarter. You, you can see it with Reggie. I like Reggie. He was able to get the edge, but he was not able to make guys miss in space when he could have made guys miss in space. Maybe like Chase might've been able to do that. And so we missed out on a couple of big plays because the way Manny Diaz's defense is, is he's going to make everything go East and West. He's going to give up the edge sometime, but he's also going to get a tremendous amount of pressure right up the middle of that def, uh, that offense. And so uh, you'll see us get the edge sometime, but we don't have the speed to really get around it and get a breakaway. That, that's kind of a tease for our film room, Jay, because I got a lot of interior pressures that, that Illinois struggle with. Manny Diaz yeah, no, I mean, loaded he, he, up on that. Manny Diaz, I will, say, I will tell you, he is, he's great at interior pressure. I think they give up a lot as far as, far as being soft on the edge. Mm -hmm. They also have a, a first round. But who are your edge players? Well, I got to be strong at defensive end and, and my cornerback I've got first round picks there so I can get away with doing that right because I have an athlete that could probably be make up for something that happens but that's the way Manny Diaz is going to do it all right Jay let's switch to the defense and let's start with this question how, how much money did Johnny Newton make the last two weeks oh, my gosh. boy I mean you, you, there was 14 NFL scouts sitting up by us in, in the press box Jay and with Chop Robinson Kalen King as you said um, you know, all these guys on, on Penn State who are projected first round draft picks or second round draft picks, Johnny Newton was the best player on the field. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm sitting there in Big Ten Network, we're watching all the games, right? And we're sitting there and saying, he's the best football player on the field. Usually we give our Saturday standouts on the final drive to a winner 
a, a team that that wins, a player that is on a winning team. I wanted to give it to Johnny Newton. I, I, I quite frankly, when you talk about, I, I'm not necessarily looking. I know people like to look at sacks. I know people like to look at pressures or tackles. For us. I look at disruption. You look at the amount of disruption he caused for the linemen of Penn State on run plays near the goal line, on the field goal, on pass plays, on getting Gabe Ackes a sack because of his pressure. It, his get off's incredible, number one. And I don't think there's a guard in this league that can pass block him at all. And they like to match him up on a guard. And he usually makes them look silly. It was a long day for some of those Penn State guards. They either ended up on their back or chasing Johnny Newton all around. Yeah, and I want to bring up Aaron Henry. Uh, one thing he did, and we saw this in the bowl game, they seemed to run that 5-1-5 five, five a little sure. bit more. Jay, I, you could probably have more knowledge of this, but it gets Johnny Newton and, and some of these outside linebackers who I thought had their best games in one-on-one -on -one opportunities. And Johnny Newton one-on-one -on -one opportunities is – is uh, it's tough for, for guards in the Big Ten, as you said. So what did you see from Aaron Henry adjustment-wise? How did they look different, if at all? So the first of all, that's a, that's, a, that's a good pickup by you. And and just so you know, you know, I love how people can – we can make up whatever numbers, uh, you know, 5-1-5. Five, five. Yeah, yeah. You could say the outside linebackers are linbacker. You could say our Akis and Coleman are linebackers. So then we turn into a 3-3-5, three, three, right? Sure. So I mean, there's all kinds of ways we could, we could spit it. Um, but as far as the way it looks lined up, it certainly does look like a 5-1-5. And I think what he's trying to do is he's trying to get his best 11 on the field, okay? Probably probably feels right now that he maybe has, with Matthew Bailey in, I know he wasn't hurt, probably has a little bit more depth at DB than linebacker, maybe. I don't know. Uh, I think Tariq Barnes is really solid. But Rosiak's young and Kruitz is young, Right. And so I think it's a combination of getting the best love on the field, but also giving them a chance, okay, to get favorable matchups. And I think that's what we saw in the defensive line where we have to see the athleticism of, of Johnny Newton. I know Keith was banged up in this game, uh, according to Brett, but, but Gabe Akis and Seth Coleman get the matchups they wanted. And I think that was a good adjustment by, by Aaron Henry and, and the staff to say, hey, here's what we're going to do. But more importantly, I thought they were, they just felt more comfortable in that set. The defense felt more comfortable in that set. And so I think it's what do my guys like to play? Not only is it like who's the best 11, let's give them the best chance, but what do they like? And I felt like they liked playing kind of the style they were playing. It wasn't exotic. They were certainly just lining up and trying to play sound technique. And, and for the most part, through three quarters, did an excellent job. Yeah, they, they bothered the heck out of Drew Aller, maybe not playing a dual threat guy as much. I mean, Drew could sure. prolong plays, uh, but I mean, with their run defense was was really impressive, Jay. And I thought Matthew Bailey was a big part of that early. I thought Clayton Bush was really good in, in run support. The corners were better in run support. Like, what did you see uh, from that run defense to, to keep Nick Singleton, you know, and, and Catron Allen really under wraps for most of the game until that, that late touchdown by Singleton. Well, let's not forget Nick Singleton was the Gatorade player of the year. Um, like for the country, not just like, like, like we're happy we get one. You know, Hank Beatty, I think was the Gatorade player of the year for Illinois. That's great. But this guy was the, the Gatorade player of the year for the country and, and Catron Allen, um, uh, all those run, all those Penn state running backs, I always say they're always built different. Oh, big tree trunk legs and everything might be the white pants or might just be the, just <laughs> legit. Those are probably the two best backs you'll probably see all year. I mean, the combo of them. I mean, there's going to be other backs there, but as far as having two backs like that. So one thing I thought that Matthew Bailey really, really adds is his size is, is a factor. It, it's, it's a big factor. His ability to run fill is a big factor when it comes. It felt like Sidney Brown's ability to fill a hole, right? And, and I think that's what we kind of miss. I think Miles Scott – is smart, but let's be honest, he's a little bit undersized. There's a reason that Miles Scott was, you know, a walk on for years because he didn't necessarily have the measurables of other guys. Not saying he's not a good football player, not saying he's not going to be a good football player. He simply doesn't have the measurables, right? I think Xavier Scott's going to be a really good football player. He, he flashes, he, he doesn't necessarily play perfect games because he, he, and no DB does, but I think Xavier Scott has the attitude and kind of that swagger of anybody that kind of those last DBs had. So I think Xavier Scott's going to be solid. But I would say this, it started up front with the pressure. How did they stop? I stopped the run. You get them in second and long, third and manageable, right? So they get off schedule. 
you get a guy in Drew Aller, first road start, always talented. I was impressed. Other than some of the drive routes that Penn State ran, a drive route is five yards across the field, we covered pretty good. Mm-hmm. We did, we struggle a little bit some of the drive route concepts and whatnot. They kind of got away from us in man coverage. But as far as the deep balls, we harassed Aller enough, got his eyes down, and it showed that our DBs, if we get pressure on somebody, don't make them cover forever, they, they can be decent, right? And so um, all in all, I just thought Bailey Bailey added a lot uh, when he was in. I thought the pressure was huge. Better on first and second down led us to have opportunities to really pin our ears back as a pass rusher. Because here's the deal. As a pass rusher, I've actually got – you might be able to find out it's a pass right away by watching the game. But – if I'm pass rushing, I've got to identify how is this guy attacking me? Is he backing up? Is he coming forward? When you know that's a passing down and they have to pass, you can really tee off from a pass rush perspective. How sustainable is this, Jay, for, for the defense? Like how much, you know, was this a building factor? You hope it's not an outlier, right? So how sustainable? Right, yeah. Well, one, I don't think it was some big exotic game plan. I just right. think it was, I just think it was let's line up with our best 11 and give them a chance to win, right? Now, I will say, I think there's a significant drop-off in our second-string D-line. Agreed. No question. Um, Johnny played they, 74 snaps. Keith played 70 in this game. Yeah, they, so, they played about 40 in the first game. Here's the deal. They they said, we want to make sure they don't have more plays uh, than they need to, especially early in the season. Well, it was do or die to get stops because the offense kept giving the ball back, right? And I was watching how much they were going to get you know, maybe Bryce Barnes in there or somebody else in there for that D line. And it wasn't a ton early in that football game. I mean, maybe two or three plays that got in, but there's a significant drop off in pressure. The moment those guys get out, we've got to build depth. I guess I'm, I'm probably most concerned about that because I'm not sure we have the depth at D line that we really need to be elite. Um, so that, that, that concerned me. I thought the DBs played better though. So that, that was, that was beneficial. It's kind of what you expected. The D line be dominant, that starting group. And then the secondary is a little bit better because of it, right? Like it's right. kind of, right. you expect the, the D line to really help that secondary. And I thought that was the case. That was, that was hundred percent the case. I mean, I know you didn't get a ton of sacks on Aller. You, you, you got a few, but he was pressured and he got his eyes down. He didn't keep his eyes down the field when he was pressured. There was a couple of guys wide open that he could have hit. But because his eyes weren't downfield, he was under pressure, wasn't able to do that. So um, overall, I think you asked, is it sustainable? I think it is sustainable, right? I don't know about the depth issue that we have on the D-line, but I think we're going to get better. Uh, this is – I'm not going to say this is the best offense they're going to face. I thought it was coming in. It might be. They're not executing at a great level right now compared to the first two games, but it's certainly some of the best athletes they'll see in the running game at offensive tackle – Maybe not on the edge. I think that probably belongs to Ohio State if they saw him in the championship game. But as far as anybody, you know, on their schedule moving forward, pretty close. Yeah. All right, Jay, Ford Atlantic, they've lost back-to-back games to Ohio and Clemson. Potential get-right game for Illinois, you hope. I don't think anyone has enough confidence yet in this program to to go into the game thinking, oh, it's going to be an absolute blowout. But uh, Tom Herman, first year, I've obviously had success as a head coach and as an offensive coordinator. What do you want most want to see from Illinois' perspective? In this well, I think Ed Warner's is offensive coordinator, right? Ah, uh, I believe. Back in the day. I, I think uh, you know. I think you know. Ed was an offensive line coach here, and then they won a national championship. Herman and him won a national championship in 2014. You know, with Ohio State, Tom Herman is is well regarded as a play caller. Obviously, he struggled as a head coach at Texas, but won a lot of games at Houston. Um, they're going to run the football. They, they like to pull the ball, pull the lineman around on the counter play, the old Zeke Elliott counter play that he ran for 250 yards against Alabama. They're going to run that play. Uh, I know that, but they're going to also air it out. Here's what I'll say, though. It always seems to me I hate playing Florida mid-majors, not mid-majors, a group of five teams. I think South Florida, UCF, I think um, FAU, you look best to pack back over the 10 years on those three schools and how many teams they've actually beaten. It's a lot, a lot of power five teams, right? And there's a lot of talent in Florida right next to them, right? And so they get a lot of the guys that maybe get overlooked. A lot of those football players before UCF was big, Glenn Mason, the old Minnesota coach, told me those guys ended up at Big Ten teams. 
you know, now, now they're at you. So I, I'm not comfortable about this game. Uh, I'm not comfortable with any game, right. but I did think it was very possible that only started one and three or two and two. I did say that. And I know you said that um, I, because I just look at, looking at the schedule, right. Uh, and we'll talk about the schedule moving forward, but I don't, I don't think it's necessarily that difficult what I've seen. <laughs> that's right. Uh, and, and that's why, Jay, you'd like to see Luke Altmaier bounce back. You'd like to see the run game get established. You'd like to see them get a lead <laughs> early in a game and see what Barry Lonnie does with his That's game the play. best point anybody's <laughs> made, regardless of me you. Let's get a lead. I mean, how many minutes have we actually led in a football game this year? I mean, as well, it was zero yes, last, last week. Yeah. Zero against Kansas. And Toledo, you got an early lead, and then you had the late lead. It wasn't very long. A couple I minutes. think we've led for a total of like six minutes. I think you know, right. like six or 10 minutes. So we have not played with the lead, which is Brett Bielema ball, right? Yeah. It's like, we're not built for a shootout. If we went to the OK Corral, wired up, we're going to shot us immediately. You know, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the thing. We were not built for that. Right. Yeah. Or back to the future with Biff, you know, and number three, you know, like he, he we would have got shot. We wouldn't even been smart enough to have the thing underneath. Like, yeah. anyway, I'm, I'm going to every shootout scene I know, but I would just say that, we're not built for that. I would love to see us get a lead. That would be it. Would be comforting a little bit. I just feel like it's so stressful. Like, okay, how do we catch up? Oh, we're only we're only seven points down. No, that that that's the old Illinois of like, okay, we're only a touchdown down. No, we got to actually start better. Gay, is there anything else in the Big Ten that really interests you so far? I mean, obviously, we're going to focus on the the Big Ten West. I look at the schedule, Jay. Speaking of the schedule. Looks like Maryland might be the toughest game you got left on your schedule based on, on what Lox is doing. That offense is really good. They might well, be the I always make fun of Maryland. Days. They always spot the other team 14 points and they score like 42. They, they've got some legit receivers. Okay. I mean, I'll just give you a rundown of a Big Ten on my take real quick. You know, Big Ten East, um, you know, uh, we talk, talk about Maryland. Lots of big receivers, as always. Jay Sean Jones, Caden Prather. Uh, Dicious. They got a bunch of athletes all over it. Their defense is better, but it's still average. Um, but they still make a lot of dumb mistakes. Maryland has penalties and sometimes turnovers, and they've gotten behind. What the, I think my team still really to beat, I, I believe, even after watching them, is, is Penn State. I think Penn State's actually going to be better than Michigan when they play. I think Penn State this year is the year they actually are able to beat Ohio State for the first time since 2016. And listen, Ohio State is explosive offensively, but they don't have a C.J. Stroud at quarterback, okay? They certainly have their weapons a receiver, and their defense – is good until you ground and pound them. I don't think they've shown they can actually be, you know, be great in ground and pound. Michigan ground and pound them and Georgia ground and pound them. Indiana, I think that's a team that we should beat, although they played better against uh, Louisville. Um, Rutgers, I think, is surprising as far as Greg sheon has got them playing defense. He's got them playing, uh, uh, running the football. They can't throw the football much, right. but it is what it is. Um, when I look at the Big Ten West, wow, okay. That's a whole different animal. Um, Four teams at one and two right now in the Big Ten West. So, yeah. So let me just say uh, say this. And, and, and one of them would be one and two probably in Minnesota if they hadn't played Nebraska. Uh, but anyway, I, I would say this. Nebraska doesn't look impressive. They look pretty average. We, we knew this, right? We, if Fickle and, and Matt Rule, many people think like, oh, my gosh, it's done. We're going to win the Big Ten. We knew. It takes a little bit of time. Let's pump the brakes. It takes a little bit of time. So when I when I look at uh, when I look at Nebraska, they're a lot farther away than people even realize they are to be a legitimate Big Ten West contender. They're they're just they're just far. There's not a ton of athletes. There's it's a rebuild. Athletes. That was a rebuild. It's, it's a total rebuild, right? Yeah. I I look at I look at Wisconsin. They've got real issues on what is their identity. They give up 380 yards passing. They're able to get turnovers, but defensively. They're not playing great. Mike Trussell defense is not playing great. Do they want to run the ball? Do they want to throw the ball? The, I, there's still a transition between between the air raid and still wanting to be an air run team because your best players in Malusi and Braylon Allen are running backs, right? Minnesota is the most boring team to watch in the world. Uh, I mean, they're not built for a shootout either. They do have some – Tyler and Taylor are, are decent running backs. I don't think Kay, Kaliak Manis scares anybody from the quarterback position. Um you know, I think I'm thinking about it. you kind of look this random. You kind of look like Tanner Morgan. Now I think about it, you know, but uh, <laughs> I got about eight well documented my love for Tanner Morgan. Northwestern <laughs> is Northwestern. Wow. They didn't, they didn't look good. And Purdue who actually was thought was better really struggled against Syracuse defensively, the man coverage and the, in the quarterback play of, of Garrett Schrader 
really, really struggled. I mean, Garrett Schrader ran for 195 yards and four touchdowns as a quarterback. I always laugh because some of those touchdowns, if it wasn't a touchdown, he would have ran for like 300 yards. Some of them were like, you know, because he was break, broke away and he was just running to the end zone. So could have had a fifth one, but he laid down at the end. Yeah. I mean, so, <laughs> so I mean, everybody's got issues, right? I, here's the good thing the West is still wide open. Yep. If Illinois plays defense, let's just say this if Illinois plays defense like they did uh, last week, they're not going to face an offense, maybe Maryland, that's as potent as Penn State. So if you don't have four turnovers, excuse me, five turnovers, four interceptions, you're going to be in every game. Yep. So it's like, I, I'm not, I'm not, you know, let's do this. Let's fire this. No, I, I'm actually, I was most concerned about up front defensive line play. We've got that figured out. I feel better about it. There's still a lot of things we got to fix up. We got an inexperienced quarterback. He's probably not as far along as we wanted to be along, but it is what it is. I think Brett's still the guy to get this right, and they're going to figure it out. Jay Lehman, you're the goods, man. Always appreciate the insight. Uh, We'll talk to you in the film room and then talk to you next week, man. Sounds great.